the godly women of the Old Testament show the distinct beauty of womanhood. And this beauty, similar to the strength of men that we were talking about earlier, this beauty is defined by God. So just as manly strength is first defined in spiritual terms, in theistic terms, so womanly beauty, there's a subject that has drawn some attention over the centuries, is first defined in Scripture not by physical appearance, not by other traits, but by the fear of God, obedience to God. We see this especially lined out, of course, in the famous passage of Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 presents us with a woman who lives her life for the Lord. That is explicitly stated in Proverbs 31, 30. She is a vivid picture of the God-centered helper, as we were just discussing. Her husband trusts in her as he sits with the elders at the city gates, Proverbs 31, verses 11 and 23. He, therefore, has the call to go out and lead the people, a call that she does not have in Proverbs 31. And while he is not home, he knows that his wife is producing a harvest of good for his children and for his home. And this godly woman's burden, very clearly in Proverbs 31, is her family and her home. She strengthens her home in numerous ways. She engages in economic activity in verses 13, 16, and 24. She cooks for her household in verse 15. She clothes her loved ones in verse 21. She speaks truth and wisdom in verse 25. The care and nurture of the godly woman's family and her home occupy her attention constantly. It's honestly funny to me uh, to, to, to hear people say that Christians believe, Christians like me, I suppose, believe that men work and women don't. Because if you're actually tracking with biblical womanhood, you see that women work very hard uh, in texts like Proverbs 31. They do an entire range of duties, and all these duties are meaningful. They may not all necessarily, in fact, most, many of them, for some women, all of them, will in no sense draw a salary. There won't be a corner office. There won't be a title on a business card. And yet, godly women who honor God's plan to build a home, make a home especially, and raise children and follow, submit to a husband are women who are working throughout Scripture seemingly perpetually. They're perpetual motion machines. And any of you who have a godly woman or who were raised by a godly woman, uh, who are married to a godly woman, will know that that picture holds true, that godly womanhood is not dull and dry. It certainly does not involve chaining women uh, to the kitchen stove or something like this. It, in fact, means unleashing a woman to do what God has made her to do, to bear and nurture children as God allows, and then to nurture a home and to support and help and strengthen a husband. This is all work that the world does not esteem and increasingly different voices in evangelicalism, like Amy Bird, who I was just mentioning, really in many senses do not esteem. But we do not pay attention, frankly, to the world's definition of these things. We focus on what the Bible calls men and women to do, and we focus not on what the culture approves of and the culture applauds. We focus on what God promotes and God applauds, and we recognize that a text like Proverbs 31 is teaching us that homemaking and child raising and husband helping all matters tremendously. It all yields tremendous blessing. Some of you have been in a home that is well-ordered and well-run by a woman, and you know the peace and serenity that comes from it, and you know what happens when a woman does not try to, in work-life balance, work a career, and raise children. You know that that is a recipe in so many cases for disaster and for stress and for exhaustion and for the family being frayed and at loose ends. And instead, there is such harmony. It's not easy. Let's not say that. But there is such harmony and blessing when a woman is set aside by a husband who who hears that biblical call to provide for a family, and then that woman is able to raise the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is not a bad thing, biblically. This is not a harmful reality. It's not something that does violence to a woman. It's not something that subjugates her gifts. Again, it's intended to unleash her, 
for the good of her loved ones and to serve up a harvest of goodness before the Lord, doxology to the Lord. The home is the nest of the family. It's a haven. It's a refuge in Scripture. And a godly wife and mother has the joy of making that home a happy dwelling place for the family. We're in a very Gnostic age in, in a lot of different senses. One of the senses we're in a Gnostic age in is that uh, so-called interactions and reputation and image matters, but the lived reality of a family does not matter. So a physical setting of a, of a family that doesn't really matter. Uh, beauty isn't a, a, a consideration we should have on our mind. Order and cleanliness, these things you can kind of just chuck to the wayside. Again, it's no easy to be a young father and young mother. There's a, all sorts of, 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 of life just coming at you at, at warp speed. Let that be said. And there's a tremendous need for a godly woman, as for a godly man, to continually go back to the well of divine grace and find their identity, not in their work, not in what they get done on a given day or don't get done, but only in Christ. Nonetheless, God has set things up so that in the Christian family, the home is a place of refuge and rest and happiness for children. We uh, believe profoundly in raising our children uh, such that they are protected and they are loved and they are built into, even as our culture does not necessarily promote these things. Now, in saying all this and staking all this out, we're really going head to head with feminism. And feminism has been tremendously influential, of course, in our society, and it has also been very influential and continues to, to really encroach into evangelicalism and the church. Early on, feminism went hand in hand with what was called free love and the severing of heterosexual sex from marriage. Feminists of 50, 60 years ago argued that womanhood should not be tied to the roles of child raising and homemaking. If, if homes and churches promoted such thinking, then they were really enslaving women to domestic duties. But all this, we need to be clear, contrasts, as I have said, with what the Scripture teaches about biblical womanhood. It's not that a woman has to be a wife and a mother to be a godly woman. That's absolutely not the case. In fact, we need to raise our girls to know the Lord well before they ever become a wife and a mother, if indeed they are called to be a wife and a mother. We need to know, though, that the woman of God is a woman of strength. She is not strong in herself, but she is grounded in God's design and God's righteous call. And she exercises dominion, as I was talking about briefly with Proverbs 31, over her environment. She does so as a woman, though. She has a unique form of strength. It's not the same form of strength that a man has. She doesn't have the same body as a man. Both men and women are human and are both image bearers. They are equal in terms of that status. But again, they have different bodies and they have the bodies they have in order to fulfill the plan of God for the sexes, for marriage, and for the family. Only a woman uh, can bear children. Only a woman can nurture children in her womb. Only a woman can nurture children outside of the woman, uh, outside of the womb, that is. Give them actual physical sustenance. A man cannot do these things. So, in talking about manly leadership, for example, we're not saying that only men do important things. Men, please hear me repeat this. I'm sure you hear this at Grace or at other churches that are affiliated with TMS, but just remember that it is, it is in no sense the case that manhood counts and womanhood is this kind of uh, uh, lesser role that doesn't really matter. God has called the sexes to different roles and different duties, and they all matter tremendously. What is more important, for example, than raising children to know the Lord? Those of us who have wives, as I do, uh, who are dedicated to child raising, to, to making disciples uh, of little boys and girls, are engaging in supernatural work, in the work of eternity, that is far more important, frankly, than what most people do in an office setting on a daily basis, or even an educational setting, choose it, to shape children, to know the living Christ is, again, eternal work. I, I, can't think, I can't think of more important work there is on planet Earth than that. 
We think of numerous examples of godly women in Scripture uh, who exercise faith and show a kind of feminine godliness, uh, and yet who do so in very difficult conditions, even, even demonstrating tenacious faith in certain instances. We think, for example, of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1 and 2, who desired the gift of children and prayed steadfastly to God that God would overcome her condition of barrenness and her persecution at the hands of Penina. We think of Esther, who obeyed her uncle Mordecai's prompting and used her unique position in the Persian kingdom and her unique beauty, (laughs) a gift of God that was not to be despised, in order to save the Jewish people. God is showing us, if we are paying attention throughout the Bible, and in this case throughout the Old Testament, that godly womanhood matters tremendously in the purposes of God. Esther was not called to a position of kingly authority, but in her role as favored wife, really, of the Persian king, she was uniquely positioned not only to to rescue her uncle, but to save the Jews. So God is teaching us something if we're paying exegetical attention to the text. We think, of course, of Deborah. Now, Deborah is often misconstrued. Deborah actually tried to get Barak in Judges 4 and 5 to go to war against Sisera. Deborah did not see that it was a glorious thing that she would lead Israel into battle against Sisera and the foes of God. Deborah wanted Barak to step up, be strong, be a man, show himself a man, and lead the people of God into battle. Nonetheless, Deborah said this, even as Barak continued to be weak, I will gladly go with you, she said, Judges 4, 9, but you will receive no honor on the road you are about to take, because the Lord will sell Sisera to a woman. So Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. That text is not giving us, in actual fact, the Deborah that egalitarians say it is. Egalitarians, of course, argue that women and men share leadership in the home and the church, unlike complementarity. Deborah is not standing up as this sort of warrior princess and lauding the fact that as a woman, she is more powerful than the men around her. Hear me very clearly. If you are doing justice to Scripture, that's a travesty to make that argument. Deborah believes that it is to Barak's shame that he is not showing courage, as we were talking about before the break. He is not leading Israel into battle. He is failing as a man, as a godly man in this respect, and she indicts him in those terms. Even as godly women today should indict men who are Christians, who fail to lead and fail to honor God by stepping up and owning their God-given role. Deborah laments the weakness of this supposed leader of God's people. Yael, in this same section of Scripture has no time for lament, but she immediately takes action, and she slays the wicked king. She drives a tent peg into his skull. So we are in no way saying, those of us who are strong complementarians, who believe in men stepping up and taking leadership, for example, we are in no way saying that godly women should just tremble in the corner in the face of wickedness. No, The Old Testament shows us godly women who do not fear the world, who fear God instead, and who act in courageous ways, sometimes in desperate circumstances when men are not stepping up in order to honor the Lord. So a a biblical woman is not one uh, who fears the world. A biblical woman is one who fears God and seeks to serve God in God-given roles and God-given ways. A biblical woman, if she is called to marriage, delights to serve her husband and follow him. She seeks to nurture and support his leadership. She does not undermine it. She doesn't whittle it away. She doesn't question him. She does offer wisdom to him. And a godly husband, a godly man, will frequently talk things through with his wife, I think, and and, and draw out her godly wisdom. He's not threatened by her. But a godly woman wants a man of God to be strong. 
She doesn't want him to be weak. She wants him to be strong in God. She wants to follow him. She wants him to lead, just like Deborah wanted Barak to lead. Deborah did not want uh, to defeat Sisera. She wanted this man of God, supposedly, to lead Israel into battle, to lead the people of God, that is, into battle. A godly woman, therefore, loves God-given duties of submission, procreation, nurture, familial care, and homemaking, according not simply to the Old Testament, but to New Testament texts like 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, Titus 2, 3 through 5. And of course, godly women in the church context do not seek to displace men from eldership and leadership and do not teach the gathered body of Christ, but instead, again, seek to nurture and support men as they own the role of shepherd of God's people, of elder. Elders don't only have elders meetings on the third Thursday of every month or something like this. Elders provide comprehensive shepherding and oversight and teaching and training of the whole church, and that is not a role that God has given to women. That is a role based on creation order. There it is, that God has given only to men. It is not arbitrary. It is not because men are more gifted than women. Women in a marriage or in a church may well have more intellectual gifting or communicative ability or other gifts we could mention than men in the church, than men in the home. Leadership in the home and the church is in no sense, biblically, dependent upon gifting. And women are not being subjugated or wronged by not being called to the role of elder. Uh, God has ordered creation in this way before the fall. And as we talked about before the break, of course, the woman did not name the man. The woman did not name the animals. The woman is not called to hold fast to her husband. The woman is not called to leave father and mother. It is the man who is called to all of these roles and these duties before the fall. And we especially see this enfleshed and, and drawn out in the New Testament. So creation order matters tremendously, and it matters even for who is called to lead God's people in the New Covenant assembly. And though we have an upsurge of women who believe that they are called often in a kind of amorphous way to teach and lead the church, I believe that we are acting biblically when we call men and men alone to the shepherding role of God's people. That is precisely what 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus 1, 5 through 9, and other texts uh, make clear. Now, if you stand up and declare these things and teach these things in different settings in the evangelical world today, you should expect that you're going to get pushback. You should expect it in some instances that people will not like that. People have been far more influenced by a neo-pagan and a feminist culture than they even know in many cases. It's the air they've been breathing. They have not simply feminist convictions, but they have feminist instincts, men and women alike, and they don't even know, again, in many cases that they have them. So part of what we're doing is we're, we're bringing people into the beauty of the biblical worldview, and we're going to have to help them unlearn not only some of those convictions, but some of those instincts, and embrace uh, the goodness of the biblical sexual ethic. There is so much more we could say about all these matters. I could give you an elective just on the sexes and sexuality from Scripture. But now I want to transition and I want to talk about Satan's challenge to the biblical sexual ethic, Satan's attack on creation order. The biblical plan and God's design of the sexes seems so basic and obvious when you work through Scripture. It's, 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 it's just brimming from so many pages and parts of the Word of God. But the natural man following Satan fights very hard against the clear teaching of the Word and the clear design of God in the world God has made. Remember what Abraham Kuyper wrote in his classic book, Lectures on Calvinism. Do not forget that the fundamental contrast 
has always been, is still, and will be until the end. Christianity and paganism, the idols or the living God. In Romans 1, 18 to 32, we have the clearest sketch Scripture gives us of what Kuiper called their paganism. Paganism, which he goes on to define as, <laughs> very simply, the idols. Uh, what I want to do is, is now walk through some of Romans 1, 18 to 32 at rapid fire pace. Let's turn there or open there and read it together afresh. Romans 1, 18. The Apostle Paul, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, writes this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and His divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. All right, let's break here and we'll come back to this passage. What have we already learned? We have learned first that wrath is now being revealed from God, from heaven, against sin. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Because we know eschatologically that wrath is going to be poured out in the end times, that God is going to cataclysmically judge the wickedness of humanity. And yet here the Apostle Paul introduces another dimension to the outpouring of wrath and teaches us that wrath is now being revealed in our time. Of course, in his context, this is the first century, but this continues, I think, in our time. Wrath is, is being revealed or made clear from heaven against the sin of mankind. And what does mankind do? Well, naturally, Paul says, by our unrighteousness, we suppress the truth. This is important because, as verse 19 makes clear, you actually can know certain things about God that are plain to you. And they're not just plain abstractly. You can know things about God as an unbeliever because God has shown it to them. End of verse 19. God has made clear in natural terms His invisible attributes, verse 20, His eternal power, His divine nature. These things, Paul says, have been clearly perceived. They're not hidden. They're not veiled. They're not distorted. Uh, they're not contaminated. There's not a veil over them. Instead, the eternal power and divine nature of God are clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. There is therefore no excuse for the unbeliever. There is, in other words, no grounding, no logical grounding for being an unbeliever. Uh, it is actually intensely ungrounded to be an unbeliever. No one has an excuse. Friends, I'm sure you know this and guessing you believe this, but there is no such thing as the neutral unbeliever or the justified unbeliever. What can be known about God is plain. The, the natural knowledge of God is immediate and evident. That's what Romans 1 is teaching us in this passage. Let me repeat that. Make sure you get this. The natural knowledge of God is immediate. It is irrefutable. There is no such thing as justified atheism. It, it is a null set. Everyone knows that God exists. Every unbeliever everywhere sees the eternal power and divine nature of God in the creation, in the created order, in the things that have been made, in this world. And Paul doesn't go on to define that explicitly. Here is precisely where you see divine attributes. But we do know from this text from Romans 1, 
that the created order testifies to uh, not just the possibility of God's existence, but to the sure reality of God's existence. So no one out there has excuse. No one out there is neutral. Instead, what takes place in the human heart is that we suppress the natural knowledge of God. Even if someone, in other words, doesn't have a Bible, even if they don't have a missionary sharing the gospel with them and teaching them the biblical storyline or whatever it may be, they still know that God exists, that God is real. In fact, verse 21 says, they knew God. Now, Paul doesn't mean savingly knew God. Nonetheless, that's a strong statement from the apostolic quill, isn't it? People know God exists, but what's the problem? Following the fall, beginning with the fall, of course, humanity does not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. Isn't that interesting? The fundamental sin is to not honor God and therefore to not give thanks. Do you see how vital it is that you honor God for who He is? and then that you give thanks to Him. If unbelief means dishonor and ingratitude, according to this text anyway, belief means honor and gratitude. Does that mark your, your daily life, honoring God as God? Thanksgiving. Do you, guys, do you overflow with thanksgiving to God in your daily life? By implication in this text, you and I should, as God is working in our hearts. Correspondingly, the unbeliever who does none of these things has become futile in their thinking. What an interesting uh, description. The unbeliever does not think right. They cannot. Their capacities of reason will not lead them to God alone. And the foolish heart of mankind, our foolish heart, is darkened. And so we become fools and exchange worship of the Creator, verse 23, for the worship of the creation or the creature. What takes place next? Therefore, God gave them up. This is the first of three iterations of God giving up. Because of unbelief, Verse 24, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So, wrath is being revealed in that God gives people up to the lusts of their hearts. That is not a form of freedom, as we have already been discussing in the class contra what the natural man thinks. You are in no way uh, being given over to freedom <laughs> when you follow your lusts. You are being given over to depravity in following your lust. You are, in other words, being enslaved. God is giving you over to enslavement, to impurity, specifically to dishonor your body because you have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And this is what sinful humanity in different forms does over and over again. Exchanges the truth about God that is clear through, through nature, through natural theology, rightly defined, and then this is exchanged for a lie. The lie, first and foremost, that God is not king, that God does not rule, that God is not God. That is the fundamental lie that is being subbed in for the truth. In other words, instead of creation order, which we discussed earlier, with God ruling all things, now man is ruling all things, and that is the central lie from which all other lies are built. And when a people embrace this lie, then you can rest assured that more lies are going to be built atop it. Verse 26, here's the second giving up. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. 
and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So this second giving up is specifically to dishonorable passions of a homosexual kind, the exchanging of what Paul calls natural relations for those that are not natural relations, which is specifically not adult men praying on adult boy, or, or, wow, that's a bad sentence, adult men praying on boys or adult women praying on girls, but men having sexual relations with men and women having sexual relations of any age with women. One of the ways this text is subverted or attempted to be subverted is that this is read as Paul speaking against pedophilia. Well, Paul is certainly speaking against pedophilia by extension, but he is speaking against what we call homosexuality. Uh, man, man, sexual activity, woman, woman, sexual activity. And note again that this is an outpouring of wrath. This is an overflow of wrath. This is part of what it means for God to be wrathful against a people, to give them up to dishonorable passions. It is not simply that such behavior invites future wrath, as it surely does. It is that when a people are embracing this in greater and greater measure, you are witnessing wrath being poured out. You are seeing present judgment play out, even as you will surely see much, much more to come. And then thirdly and finally, verse 28, there is the third giving over. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So in this third giving up that Paul defines, it is not simply the lusts of the heart that are given up. It is not simply giving over to dishonorable passions of a specifically homosexual kind. It is, thirdly, a debased mind, such that the entire person is shot through with pollution of every form, sin. Note that this is not a psychological study of humanity. Surely there will be psychological manifestations of sin. Nonetheless, this is God giving people over to all manner of evil that flows from a debased mind. The unredeemed heart is impure. It is wickedly lustful. It is not just a little bit off. It is impure in extremity, built on a lie. The unbelieving passions are dishonorable to God, chasing after what is unnatural, showing us, by the way, that there is such a thing as what is natural. The Greek term for nature is phusin in the Greek. Uh, there is an entire theology in this word nature used here in verse 26, phusin, contrary to nature. This tells us that God has made humanity in such a way that there is what is natural and there is what is unnatural. And that is a further manifestation, therefore, of what we call natural theology. When, when you understand that men and women have been created, uh, at least in terms of design, to be married, then you recognize that there is something that we call nature that testifies to divine making, that is itself a sign that God is real and that there is a creator. The fact that the sexes are complementary 
according to their bodily design for sexual union, is itself a witness, again, to divine making and to creation order. These are not just incidental biological facts that sola scriptura people set to the side. No, the Apostle Paul is telling us that God offers a witness unto himself in nature, in the natural ordering of the human body in a complementary fashion. So when somebody is going against what is natural, in other words, they are going against not simply divine design, but going against God himself. To oppose nature as God made it is to oppose God. And this is part of how we see that there can be no grounds for what we call, or what some call, that is, gay Christianity. Gay Christianity is identified here according to what is natural and unnatural. And there can be no merger of Christianity with what is unnatural. Because what is unnatural is not simply not the way things are supposed to work. What is unnatural is against God. Because God is the one who made nature. God has given us a book. Yes, God wrote this book. But God also wrote nature. You understand? So there can be no merger of Christianity with what is unnatural in any form. That is to merge what is of God with what is abomination. And there is therefore no ground for approving so-called gay Christianity of any form, whether in behavior, whether in desire pattern, or even what is called orientation. Instead, all forms of homosexuality, whether it is at the level of thought, desire, speech, mode of decorum, behavior, must be seen as unnatural, ungodly, an assault upon not only the design of God, but upon God himself, which means that further, when someone has such instincts, such a draw, such a compulsion, whether they want that or not, whether that is the environment they were reared in or not, the only appropriate response is repentance and faith in God. The only right reaction to homosexual inclination of any kind is repentance. There is no form, according to this section of Scripture and several others, in which we can approve of any form of homosexuality, whether activity, desire, identity, orientation, or any other manifestation. It is all unnatural. People only embrace this when God gives them up. Do you understand this? A church, a movement, a blog, an individual who promotes homosexuality in any form as compatible with Christianity is saying that that which is the manifestation of God's wrath upon humanity is actually compatible with Christianity. And that, my dear friends, I, su I, I suspect the point is now sufficiently clear, but that is blasphemy. That is blasphemy. And any who make that move are not just making an unfortunate move or having a different position than what TMS promotes or Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City promotes. They are inviting wrath to come upon them. The terms here are very, are very clear in Romans 1, and the stakes are very high. And so finally, there is this third giving over to a debased mind, debased heart, debased passions or desires, and then the third section that we covered, a debased mind. 
a God giving this over. When you come to understand these things, then you come to understand just what we are up against. Friends, please hear me. We are not simply faced with certain less than ideal manifestations of rebellion against God in Romans 1. What we are up against is a system that I believe you can call neo-paganism. You will get this in Reenchanting Humanity. You'll see it as well in the book that Gavin Peacock and I wrote. But suffice it to say, you are not just, you're not just in non-ideal territory when you're drawn to these things. You're being drawn to the anti-system of Satan. God has a righteous sexual ethic that I was trying as quickly as I could to sketch out this morning. Satan also has a system that approves of everything that God condemns. And Satan is trying as best he can to get every person he can to embrace this anti-divine design, which again, I believe we can call in summary form neo-paganism. Paganism meaning, meaning uh, idolatry, Satan's own design or anti-design. But of course, Satan doesn't in truth have a design, does he? All he has is a corruption of God's design. Sin is not actually something tangible. Sin is the corruption of what God has made. That's what sin is. So neo-paganism is a major competitor to the church. And young people in our youth group or our college group who are pulled to uh, sexual evil are not simply being tempted to do stuff they shouldn't do. It's much bigger than that. And it's much more terrifying than that, frankly. Satan is trying to wrap an entire cloak around them and shut out the light and enfold them in an anti-system that I believe we call neo-paganism. And embracing such behavior as we have been describing, whether it is bending your gender, which I'll talk more about in a minute, or whether it is homosexuality in any form, again, is tasting the first sip of wrath upon humanity. John Murray, the great Presbyterian theologian, said it well. God's displeasure is expressed in his abandonment of the persons concerned to more intensified and aggravated cultivation of the lusts of their own hearts, with the result that they reap for themselves a correspondingly greater toll of retributive vengeance. In other words, the more you let your sin off the leash, the greater toll you will reap. This is what happens when we follow the flesh. The lusts of the flesh are nothing other than paganism at work in us. And this is why it's not just homosexuality or gender bending in view here. Of course, there were all sorts of sins that Paul identified at the end of this passage that we have covered. But anytime you and I are, are giving ourselves over to heterosexual lust, we are in the same territory. We are letting our wicked desires off the leash. We are following paganism. We are not following Christianity, and we need to know that Satan is trying to wrap us in a cloak and shut out the light. All of this means that we are up against neo-paganism today. Neo-paganism, to give you an even more precise definition than what I've already quickly given you, is the anti-wisdom of the serpent. It is the anti-wisdom of the serpent which deconstructs creation order. It is the anti-wisdom of the serpent which deconstructs, deconstructs excuse me, creation 
order. And it replaces divine order with a new order, an anti-order, in which it is not God who rules over all things, but it is Satan who rules over all things. In Satan's anti-order, to press into this further, there is no creator, there is no divine design, there is no male or female, there is no script for sexuality, there is no God-designed family with a father, mother, and little boys and girls. There is no need to protect and care for children at all. Abortion is a very, very key element of paganism. There is no Savior. There is no Lord. And there is no end to the cosmos. There's no telos. There's no judge of evil. According to the theologian Peter Jones, who has done the most to write about paganism. Everything reduces to one in this system. So Jones contrasts two systems in his writings. Jones taught for many years at Westminster West. There's one-ism and there's two-ism. We've already covered this in a different form. In two-ism, biblical faith, there's creator and there's creature. God stands above and apart from His creation. There is a, an absolute distinction, as we've already talked about, between God and everything else. Everything is not God, and God is not everything. Pantheism. Oneism is essentially pantheism. There's no distinctions. There's no creator God. Everything is one. There's no creator and there's no creature. Again, there's sameness. Jones says, everything is made of the same stuff. Matter is eternal and it has a spark of divinity within it. Accordingly, Jones says this, there's no category for sin because everything is the same. Rocks, trees, good and evil, man, God. Again, according to Jones, everything is one. Oneism versus biblical Christianity. Two, creator, creature. Paganism, therefore, promotes oneism, sameness, androgyny, amorphousness, no distinctions, everything reducing to the same substance and same essence. Where you see distinctions, therefore, according to a pagan mentality, you're seeing, you're seeing something that should be abolished. Is this sounding familiar at all with your experience of living in 21st century America? Is 21st century America in many respects, friendly to distinctions. No, it is not. A pagan person, therefore, distrusts morality because morality introduces what? Distinctions, ethical distinctions. Downplays, pagan person downplays absolute truth. Oh, you better believe they do. Because there is truth in the lie. Well, that flows from Tunis, doesn't it? That flows from there being God and there being everything else. God is holy. God is perfect. God is righteous. Satan is not. Truth is objective. Neo-paganism says there is no such thing as absolute truth, which is, of course, an absolute truth, isn't it? Nonetheless... Those who speak as if there is objective truth are those who offend sensibilities. 
according to neo-paganism by extension. Continuing on, the cosmos is self-generated. There is no creator. There's not even an origin to, to the creation. There's no higher purpose to life. In sum, paganism offers humanity a de-godified theology and spirituality. A de-godified theology and spirituality. People around us who are influenced in one form or another by this general system I'm calling neo-paganism still believe, many of them, in spirituality. They're a spiritual person. There's the cosmos. Everything is one. But they don't believe in divine, biblical theology and spirituality. They believe in man-made theology and spirituality. As I have said, one major expression of paganism is homosexuality. What's the connection? The connection is that in homosexuality, the distinction that God has coded into nature, man and woman, complementarity, equal but distinct, is erased. The distinction between man and woman in sexual union is gone. And man now fornicates with man. You understand how that fits hand in glove with a pagan mentality that denies divine design. This is how we understand then that committing a homosexual act is not only against God's will, but is against God's design. And I believe that is why abomination attaches to homosexuality in different places in Scripture. It's because homosexuality is not simply a sin against God's will. A sin against God's will sends you to hell for eternity. But the special ferocity of God against Sodom and Gomorrah is generated, I believe, I think, by the fact that it's not only God's will that is blasphemed by Sodom and Gomorrah, but God's design that is blasphemed. So homosexuality, when it is embraced by a people, is a sure sign not simply that there's a sub-biblical sexual ethic, but in truth that any vestige of creation order has been displaced and replaced by a pagan sexual ethic. I hope that you are understanding, as I am trying to lay out this material, just how high the stakes are, therefore, for the church, and just how rebellious it is to bring together Christianity and homosexuality. But that's not all. Today we have seen the rise of what is called transgenderism. Transgenderism represents the rejection of gender essentialism, so-called. Gender essentialism means that there are essential differences between the sexes, that the sexes are essential realities, ontological realities, hard and fast realities. According to the LGBT movement that embraces, of course, homosexual uh, activity and thinking, transgenderism stands for the rejection of gender essentialism. And this is because gender is not a fixed reality. Gender is fluid and formless. Gender is a construct. In other words, it is created by humanity. There's no creator who has made man and woman, male and female, Genesis 1.27. No, 
the human race, the human person is a blank slate. Everyone figures out their own identity. Everyone must look within themselves to be authentically true to themselves. And then you should express who you truly are once you discern that and divine that. And then, correspondingly, that identity should be affirmed following all of this. Transgenderism represents, therefore, the rejection of biblical manhood and womanhood. Transgenderism is the latest stage of what is sometimes called the sexual revolution, but is more properly identified, I believe, as neo-paganism. Transgenderism is altogether the rejection of divine design because it says that the second detail of your human identity, your manhood or your womanhood, is actually not something that God has made It is only something that has been biologically signaled by your genitalia. But your body and your identity are distinct. And the term for this is your brain sex as contrasted with your biological sex. Make sure you understand this. Your brain sex versus your biological sex. Your biological sex, again, refers to your anatomy, your genitalia to speak rather impolitely here. Your brain sex is your true gender identity. And according to our neo-pagan culture, those two things are often not the same. You can have the body parts of a man, but the brain sex of a woman. You can have the body parts of a woman, but the brain sex of a man. Christianity will in no sense allow for that distinction, which is part of why you've already heard me say the term to use in all these conversations is not gender, it is sex, because sex refers to us as either a man or a woman, either a man or a woman in an essentialist form. We do not therefore teach in the church that the people to whom we minister have a biological sex and a brain sex. We teach that God has given you a bodily identity. Your identity corresponds to your body. There is no distinction between your body and your identity as made by God in divine design. It may feel that way to some people as a result of the fall. People may feel that they are indeed trapped in the wrong body. So we have a category for that. Hear me. But we don't have a category for seeing such a distinction as valid and certainly not seeing such a distinction as righteous. If a person feels that they are trapped in the wrong body, I talked about this three months ago when I came out to the men's ministry here at Grace with Brad Clausen on transgenderism. If you'd like uh, some Q&A on that, you can find that on the Grace Community Church website. If somebody feels that they are trapped in the wrong body, we need to not aid and abet that sensation. We need to not encourage that. We need to treat that condition morally and theologically. Because in Scripture there are no grounds for believing that you can separate your body from your identity. If I'm trying to say this as simply as I possibly can, your body is your identity. You men who who are ministering in a bold and brave new age, a brave new world, this is part of what you need to preach and teach as the whole counsel of God. Your body is your identity. You have been made a man or a woman for God's glory. You have not been given certain body parts and then later in life 
you choose or you try to discern if your body parts sync up with your true, authentic self. You understand your authentic self only according to the body God has given you. So what neo-paganism separates and severs body from identity, Scripture holds together. It is true that there are some people, a very tiny fraction of the population, who are born with both male and female genitalia. Sometimes this condition is called intersex, but a better term for it is a disorder of sexual differentiation. A disorder of sexual differentiation, DSD. If you'd like to read more about this, you can see the ethicist Alan Branch's book on transgenderism. I teach with Alan Branch at Midwestern Seminary. His book on transgenderism is very helpful, and this is one of the most helpful parts of it. You should not see having male and female genitalia alike as a neutral reality. It's not a neutral reality. It's an effect of the fall. And what needs to be done is that child needs to have someone determine, medical professionals, of course, determine if there is a female chromosome. And if there is, then that child needs to be raised as a, as a woman, needs to, needs to recognize that, in fact, though there has been biological uh, confusion play out at the bodily level, nonetheless, this child is actually a woman. If there is no female chromosome, then the child should be raised as a man, and surgery should be done along those lines in each case. But uh, the existence of a DSD, of this kind of disorder, does not tell us that God's design is for us to be in confusion. A DSD is an effect of the fall. It's not a positive state. Part of how we know that God wants us to own our body is the explicit teaching of God in Deuteronomy 22.5. Please turn with me there or open it up. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, the text reads, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Biblical theologian Jason DeRoshi, also a Midwestern colleague, wrote this in his book, How to Understand and Apply the Old Testament, on this passage. God chose to frame these prohibitions as durative in the Hebrew so that we should read the not as a never, a woman shall never wear a man's garment, nor shall a man ever put on a woman's cloak. In other words, Deuteronomy 22.5 is telling us there is never a righteous context for cross-dressing, which tells us that the way you present yourself, even to the clothes you wear, is a matter of God's glory. So we don't have the opportunity, according to Scripture, according to Old Covenant law, in Deuteronomic form, to cross-dress, to bend our gender. Doing so, in ancient terms, is an abomination to God. It is, in other words, I believe, the contravention not only of God's will, but the contravention of God's design for humanity. Cross-dressing, therefore cannot be understood as anything but unrighteous. It is evil behavior. Therefore, a society that embraces cross-dressing, gender-bending, transgender identity, and, and et cetera, and so on, is embracing wickedness. And it is not the case. Do not believe the lie that Scripture fails to speak to this. No Scripture does not use the term transgender. That's a new term. No Scripture doesn't use the term orientation. But Scripture clearly speaks to this practice and even the mentality behind this practice, and it calls, us un, it, calls it unrighteous. 
Deroshi puts the point precisely. Idolatry gives glory to someone other than Yahweh. Witchcraft looks to means other than God's word to discern his will or what will happen in the future, speaking of the broader context of Deuteronomy 22. And dishonest gain diminishes the value of God's image in others. We must conclude, therefore, Deroshi writes, that something about transgender expression and gender confusion directly counters the very nature of of God. And all this means then that you and I, now and in days to come, men, are going to have to work with people who are being influenced and even trained by a pagan society to see a distinction between their body and their identity, who in some cases, by the way, have experienced uh, sexual sin. Have, have been victimized and have been warped by abuse of a sexual kind, we have to help them understand that even if they have been wronged and that wrongdoing has led to confusion with regard to their identity, it is unrighteous, again, to cross-dress, gender-bend, or embrace a transgender identity. Instead, they must, they must reject sin in those senses, and embrace their bodily, God-given identity. Now, you might be thinking, as I'm saying these things, that no Christian, no theologian would disagree with this, that this is an elective, and this is rather non-controversial stuff in Christian circles. Uh, you may be well-intentioned in thinking that, but you would be wrong. Uh, for example, Christianity Today has repeatedly featured the writing of Mark Yarhouse, who is a widely respected, widely quoted uh, counselor, uh, Christian psychological professional and professor, who has written in his material on transgenderism and these matters that while there is some moral component to cross-dressing and gender-bending, it is not only a moral theological reality. And so pastors and people in ministry who are working with people who have these predilections can in fact uh, contemplate uh, in encouraging such individuals to continue cross-dressing and even potentially to have surgery. Um, you can read Yarhouse's case uh, for yourself in his book on gender dysphoria but suffice it to say that a good number of people in the evangelical world believe that your house is right and believe that when we're faced in pastoral ministry, for example, let's say with a teenager who is cross-dressing, uh, we, we should not speak to that as a moral and theological reality. We should instead try to help them be as healthy as they can be. Uh, try to be authentically true to themselves. Um, and get the care that they need in a kind of, again, non-moral, non-theological sense. But I want you to understand that Deuteronomy 22 and other texts in Scripture directly counter this evangelical thinking that I have just lined out. It's not only Deuteronomy 22 that speaks against cross-dressing and gender-bending. In the New Covenant, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 11, which we covered yesterday briefly, speaks to this as well. Let's pick up in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. The Apostle Paul says this, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and that man is the head of the woman, and God is the kephale, the head of Christ. And then moving ahead to verses 7 through 15. A man should not cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. So too, woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman, and all things come through God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair... 
it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given her as a covering. There's a lot in view here in this passage, as I said yesterday as well. I believe that verse 3 teaches that uh, the Father is eternally the head of Christ, and Christ eternally submits to the Father. There are some in evangelical circles today who believe that that view is not biblical and is wrong, and there's a lively debate and discussion to have over precisely that point. There are other texts that come into play as well, but this is a passage that lines out authority and locates authority in the Godhead. Some would say it's only economic headship that the Father has over Christ, and then economic, of course, into eternity to come. Uh, nonetheless, I would differ and say that the Father, you look at Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, is acting authoritatively to plan redemption, to plan salvation. Uh, for example, I preached at Kindred Community Church uh, just a few months ago and gave a sermon on Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, if you want to look for that, Kindred being a, a church that would be very much aligned with grace. Very thankful for Philip de Corsi's ministry myself. Okay, that's a matter, though, to search out in different discussions. This concept of authority comes into play later in 1 Corinthians 11, 11 because the woman is supposed to display the fact that she is under her husband's authority. And as I said to you yesterday, uh, I think that the way she displays this is not by having a, a piece of fabric on her head, as you will see in some evangelical circles, but by, as she is able, having long hair. Paul says at the end of this passage that nature, there's nature again, there's nature. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? So. This passage, in sum, bringing it back to bear on the discussion of transgenderism, cross-dressing, and gender bending, teaches us that it is not right for men to look like women and women to look like men. Instead, we are supposed to display creation order by the way we present ourselves. We are supposed to have the hair length, according to this passage, of a man and the hair length of a woman. And we, in fact, glorify God when we, as a man, present ourselves as a man and when, as a woman, again, according to season of life, if a woman can have long hair, uh, we present ourselves as a woman if we are, in fact, a woman. Now, note where Paul is writing this to. Paul is saying these things to the Corinthian church. You and I might think, our context is so neo-pagan. Our context is so pagan. It's so unique. It's so unlike things today. But that is absolutely not the case. The ancient city of Corinth outdid San Francisco, outdid L.A., outdid our present context. In Corinth, uh, there was the uh, temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And at the temple of Aphrodite, there were temple prostitutes. And these temple prostitutes were in many cases uh, cross-dressers. So there would be men, for example, who would present themselves as women. And so there would be homosexual prostitution taking place as part of pagan worship to Aphrodite. You think it's tough to be a Christian now. You think we're up against a neo-pagan order today in 21st century America. That is quite a context to behold, I would submit, along these lines. One uh, Bible resource, Zondervan Illustrated Bible Dictionary, says that Corinth had no rivals as a city of vice. In fact, there was an ancient saying to live like a Corinthian or to Corinthianize someone. This meant that you initiated someone into a life of untold debauchery. That is the church, that is the context that Paul is addressing in First and Second Corinthians. These are the people that he is writing to when he gives the instruction in chapter 11, for example, to have men present themselves as men 
and women present themselves as women. Do you understand this? He, he is not writing to people who would hear this kind of instruction and think, ah, okay, well, that is ancient truth, but that's not truth that I'm going to directly have relevance for today. You may have been raised in a town or a city, for example, where you heard about such pagan behavior, but you weren't intimately familiar with it. It wasn't a major part of where you were from. Please note that the Corinthians understood these trials and these challenges for ministry and for biblical faith, for the gospel, firsthand. You understand the point? People in the church that Paul is addressing almost undoubtedly had firsthand knowledge and experience of such neo-pagan behavior. This was not strange to them. They were former, I'm guessing, some of them, temple prostitutes or those who sampled this wicked behavior. Some of them undoubtedly bent their gender and cross-dressed. I, I, I don't think I'm on a ledge here in saying these things because the Apostle Paul is instructing this church in these matters. He's telling them not to do what other people in Corinth all around them are doing. Men, more simply, the Corinthians are influenced and pulled toward these depraved behaviors and mindsets in their context. They're in the thick of it. And it's to these people that the Apostle Paul says, be a man, be a woman, present yourself out of a doxological desire to God as such. Show that androgyny is not real. Show your neighbors, your unbelieving neighbors, the beauty of biblical womanhood, the beauty of biblical manhood. Don't compromise it. Don't think that it's a small, secondary, tertiary matter. It's not. It's of vital importance. This is a major way, Corinthian church, that you are called to be a witness to your context. This is not a small thing. You, you need to be such a biblically captivated Christian that you go to great lengths to distinguish between men and women. And you're doing so because you believe in the beauty of God-centered manhood and God-centered womanhood. Men, does this sound relevant to the 21st century? I think it does. I think this is where we are today. I think that we are in a Corinth-like context. And people all around us, yes, need the gospel. They absolutely need the gospel to be saved, to be born again. But they also need, as part of our evangelistic and apologetic witness, they need us to be God-captivated men and God-captivated women. Manhood and womanhood of a biblical kind, of a gospel-shaped kind, is going to be evangelistic today. It's going to have an effect. It's going to make you stand out. Here again, we're back at this apologetic discussion that I keep surfacing. Paul didn't want the Corinthians to play down their biblical manhood and womanhood in order to be evangelistically fruitful. Paul wanted the Corinthians to stand apart and stand out from the pagans. Christianity is supposed to be apart from paganism. It's not supposed to be like it. It's supposed to be distinct from it. Biblical manhood and womanhood is beautiful. The biblical sexual ethic by extension is marvelous. It's lovely. It's joy-giving. It's aesthetic. And it will have an evangelistic and apologetic effect wherever it is taught, wherever it is proclaimed, wherever it is is lived out. All this is what the Apostle Paul, I believe, is saying to the Corinthian church. And this speaks again to us not presenting a niceified, pagan-compatible Christianity to our neighbor, neighbor. It speaks to us giving people the unique beauty and glory 
and distinctiveness of the Christian worldview, the worldview that is powered by and created by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Becoming saved, becoming born again, does not mean that you leave behind meaningful manhood and womanhood. It means that you embrace it. And in the context of the Christian family, it it means that you train your boys to be men and your girls to be women. It means that we're not simply saying these things from a pulpit, but we're, we're bringing these truths with us everywhere we go. And so when I go on a trip to Los Angeles, California, and it's a lengthy trip, and I'm away from my family, I take my son, I have three children, I have a 12-year-old daughter, Ella, a nine-year-old son, Gavin, and a six-year-old daughter, Ainsley. Three kids, girl, boy, girl, 12, 9, 6. And I take Gavin aside and I say to Gavin, you, now that daddy is gone, are the man of the house and you need to protect the girls. Now, in practical form, my son is quite young. (laughs) He is not uh, Samson in terms of his bearing. He's probably not going to be a football linebacker at USC. So uh, we're adjusting all our uh, expectations for the future accordingly. I'm probably going to have to pay for college is what this means. Um, Nonetheless, I am trying to train my son in biblical manhood in a very practical, tangible way. And my wife and I are encouraging our daughters, to cook and to bake uh, uniquely. Uh, I'm not saying it's wrong for a man to do these things, of course. Nonetheless, my wife and I are trying to shape our daughters such that they see the beauty of being a nurturer of children and a homemaker and one who blesses a family through things like a delicious meal. My wife is training my daughters to keep a house, Now, all this sounds, even saying this to to Christian ministry workers in training, all of it sounds very countercultural, I know. It it sounds it even to us, perhaps, for a woman to make meals and keep a house. What is this, you know, 476 B.C.? But again, if these are biblical priorities and biblical realities, then these are things that we have no shame in proclaiming and celebrating and training our sons and our daughters to inhabit. We want our sons to be leaders, protectors, and providers. We want our daughters to be those who who revel in child raising, homemaking, and husband supporting. These are not bad realities. These are biblical callings. These are beautiful aspects of what it means to be human. To be human means means to be made in the image of God, means to be an image bearer. That was day one of this class. But it also means to be a God-captivated man for the glory of God and a God-captivated woman for the glory of God. All this is entailed from these texts that we pull together in seeking to build a biblical sexual ethic. All right. I'm going to pause at this point. We are nearly at the conclusion of uh, my material for today. We've covered a great deal uh, of biblical uh, texts and uh, theology. And so let me pause and see if there are any questions about anything that I have covered about homosexuality, transgenderism, neo-paganism, complementarity, egalitarianism. This is your chance to shoot. Uh, We have some time probably get out early today, so let me know if you have questions. Do the little hand raise thing on Zoom, and I will see you. Uh, David, go ahead. Hi, uh, a couple questions. Uh, first, you talked about the idea of body being identity, and, and I think I understand what you're trying to say is that there isn't a difference between our identity and our physical expression of what we have, but really from a biblical perspective, wouldn't it be better to say uh, that God has assigned us identity, that, and that's really the source of our identity, and that it is expressed chromosomally and usually physically? Because if you, if you go down to the level of 
uh, body is identity, then we can conclude that changes in our body also change our identity, since body is identity. Hmm. That's not true. Really, our identity comes from God's design. It doesn't matter how you manipulate your body. Yeah. Your identity is assigned by God, right? Yeah. Uh, when I'm saying your body is your identity, I don't mean that however you change your body changes your identity. I'm referring to God's gift of your sex uh, in the womb and then manifested, of course, when you come out of the womb. So someone can try to change their body, but they can't change what God has made. They're always whatever God has made them to be. So I think I'm still, there, there's more dimensions to human identity than just your body. That part of what you said I think is true. So that's why yesterday you got four hours on the image of God, right? Because being made in God's image is actually the first marker of human identity. You have a spiritual identity, right? You're made by God for God to know God. Um, so there's more dimensions of human identity, yes. But your bodily, your identity, excuse me, is never less than your body. That's what I'm after in this part of the material. Your identity as a person, excuse me? Yeah, but I'm even comfortable saying your identity is bound up in your body. Or if I really want to get uh, base level, honestly, your identity is your body. I haven't said that your identity is only your body, so I'm nuanced here, at least I need to be, but I have tied identity irrefutably um, to, to the body that God has given you. Human identity is constituted first and foremost in the image of God, you're a spiritual being, but then the second truth of your human identity is that you are either a man or a woman, and that flows, that's exegetical, that's Genesis 1. Uh, 27. So um, I'm trying to do justice to both, but I'm still comfortable saying, look, <laughs> your body is so important to who you are that it's telling you who you are. There's more to learn because you're not only bodily, right? But it's not less than your body. More than your body, never less than. Mm -hmm. Satan's dominion. Is that fair? Yes, that was the in, that was the initial definition. Yes. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out uh, what it is, what it is that defines neopaganism as separate from just sin, or would you say that all sin is neopaganism? That is basically where I think neopaganism goes. I think that when I'm talking about Satan's anti-order. I'm saying we don't just do bad things. We're always following either God or following Satan. So yes, I actually do think that the satanic system, Jesus calls um, those who are opposing him uh, of their father, the devil. So there's the true father, God the father, and then there's an anti-father. And I think, this is my argument here in the class and in my book, Reenchanting Humanity, I think there's a kind of <clears throat> true creation order that we talked about first in the class, and then there's an anti-order. And you heard me define that as not actually a separate substantive order, but the corruption of God's design. So yes, if you play it all the way through, I think that sin is neo-paganism and neo-paganism is sin. But I do think you can say more than just their sin. I think you can identify certain facets of the system that Satan foments. And I think Romans 1 is the text that takes us as deep into Satan's system as we can go to understand especially how Satan not only opposes creation order, but sets up an anti-order, a kind of alternative sexual ethic. And that's where our culture is today, by the way. Our culture is not just sinning against God. It is. 
it's actually following a kind of mirror sexual ethic where it's not uh, so-called heterosexuality that is righteous. Essentially, homosexuality is righteous, where it's not owning your bodily identity is righteous, contravening your bodily identity is righteous. We could go on, but that's what I'm after. There's a system that we're, that we're in opposition against. Um, or are they synonymous? I think they're basically synonymous. And that's the point I was bringing out with Peter Jones. Jones's argument is that everything is either oneism or twoism. So Jones's point is that every philosophy, every system ultimately traces back to oneism. And the reason I cited him is because I think he's basically right. Now, you're going to have to do some technical work to, to substantiate that in certain claims. But Jones is very similar to Van Til in that Van Til is going to argue that at some level, every system except Christianity is going to lead to pantheism. It's not going to lead to Trinitarian personalism, one God, three persons. And therefore, it's always going to be, it's always going to collapse into sameness. And I think that's true. Thank you. Yeah, good questions. Jared. Um, so I have a friend and just uh, experience growing up in the church. You know, he's a, he's a man, but he has long hair. And I don't think people would look at him and think he looks like a woman or whatever because it's just so common. But I guess I'm curious in a church context, like where do you... I guess, draw the line and, okay, that's too long, okay, that's not. How do you go about figuring that out? Um, your hair is too long, so you should, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm being facetious. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me scrutinize everyone on this call uh, according to the precise hair length. Um, I don't know what the precise hair length would be, but my burden is, is not to start where I think a fair number of evangelicals today start, which is in the gray zone, which is in the less clear. I want to start with the clear and then work to the less clear in all facets of my theology. And I think what is clear in 1 Corinthians 11 is that Paul is calling men and women to look distinct, and the, the marker of distinction that he lays out is not you know, dresses and pants or something like this, or cloaks, it's hair length. So I would say to a guy who has long hair that I think he should consider 1 Corinthians 11. I don't know precisely at what moment, you know, he's looking like a woman and a woman is looking like a man. But what I, I do want to do with my children, for example, or if I'm leading young people, is I want to help them understand that 1 Corinthians 11 is not a jump ball. Um, it, it's not something you follow if you want to. It's like the rest of Scripture. So a, a man should honor God by looking distinct from a woman. And a woman should honor God by looking distinct from a man. And failure to do so, I think, is sin. I'm willing to... I'm willing to admit that there's, there are some gray areas that then follow, right? That always happens with biblical principles. Thank you, Jacob, as we take them in. Uh, I'm, willing, I'm willing to admit gray area. there are gray areas in, in lots of areas of the Christian life, right? But that principle is clear, I think. Now, people then want to go to Scotland and Braveheart and <laughs> men in kilts. and we, that, th Those are other... We can have those conversations. I, I'm not responsible for raising William Wallace, uh, although it'd be pretty cool if my son was like him. I, I'm, I'm responsible for raising my son. So um, I'm not going to start in the less clear, though, even there, and say, ah, well, it's just contextual. I, I'm, I, other people may read this differently, but I'm under the authority of the Word of God. I, I'm not bound by the Old Covenant but I'm under the new covenant, 
and I'm responsible for obeying all the teaching of the new covenant. And I'm going to, and I'm going to try to train people to do so. Now, I'm going to sound strange in doing so, and that's where, you've heard me say this a few times, but that's where we understand just how much a gender-neutral culture has influenced us and has shaped us, and not just us, but churches, people in churches. I actually think, though, I may be the last, last guy to declare this, but uh, I actually think this is a way we witness to the world. We aren't gender androgynous like so many people around us. We believe that God made manhood and womanhood, and it's not seventh-tier theology. It's actually very important. That's what I would say. Jacob, yes. Yeah, I had a question about neo-paganism as well. Uh, the order you gave from Genesis 3 was super helpful, going from creature over the woman, over the man, over God. And you may have done it, and I just missed it, but do you see that same uh, anti-order in Romans 1 as well? Yes. Exchanging the creatures and the genders being confused, then that being placed over God entirely? I absolutely do. Yes. I, I didn't focus on that specific theme when we walked through uh, Romans 1, but I did surface it when I talked about verse 25, exchanging the truth for a lie, and then I could have said more about worshiping and serving the creature there, because that's absolutely what is happening with the anti-order of Satan. Satan, and that's another dimension, there's so, there's so many... This is, the, this is the danger of trying to talk about the fall and sexuality <laughs> and these things in, in a short session. But Satan doesn't just want them to rebel against God, Adam and Eve, that is. Satan wants to be worshipped. And, Sat and here's, the, here's the really chilling reality. In following Satan, they are worshipping him. People think of worship as what you do when you raise your hands, right? In a darkened, you know evangelical setting with smoke pouring out from a fog machine. But worship is following. Worship is obeying. What you obey, you worship. What you worship, you obey. And that's what Satan is after, isn't it? He is after not just, hey, break God's law. Hey, worship me. And that's what we do. We worship, but, but there's two dimensions. There's an interesting... Um, breadth in that phrase, served the creature, or worshipped and served the creature, because I think you, you can actually worship different creatures, can't you? You can worship humanity, and you can also worship Satan. You can even worship animals. But well, all of that ultimately is Satan worship. And all of that is the absolute inversion of creation order. The creature is the last, the, the, the animal, the, the serpent, is the last thing that is supposed to be worshipped, but it's the first thing that Satan wants worshipped. And that's why it's so important that we affirm that Satan uh, took the form of a serpent. You will read exegetes and theologians who don't seem to understand this because they don't, they don't understand that the fall is the subversion fundamentally of creation order. And so there, it's now becoming more and more fashionable to question whether the serpent is Satan. There are very well-respected theologians and scholars now who are, who are distancing themselves from what happens in Genesis 3 from Satan of the New Testament. And there are various conversations to have around the identity of the serpent. But one absolutely crucial reason why Satan took the form of a serpent is to subvert the creation order in the fullest possible extent. This is, this is when Baker Mayfield took the flag of the opposing team several years ago when he was in college, and he went out to, to midfield, 
and he threw the flag into the logo of the team, the home team he had just defeated. This is not an incidental fact, a weird detail of Genesis 3. Satan takes the form of the serpent to throw the flag into the midfield logo of God in Eden. He's he's blaspheming God as much as he can because he's taking the lowest thing and, and, and causing the man and the woman to worship it, which is just unspeakable evil in God's face. So all these details matter, and all of this is the anti-order that Satan is after. Which, Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. So when you guys are reading in your Old Testament classes or whatever other classes, and you may come into context, contact with scholars who deny that the serpent is Satan, you think, you, I, I hope you remember this element because it's actually, <laughs> it's not just historically important, but it's theologically so significant that Satan incarnates as a serpent, which Genesis 1, ah, I need to get the precise verse. What does Genesis 1.30 say? To every... Uh, no, 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 no. Every beast of the earth, Genesis 1.30, to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And then in verse 126, ah, here it is, verse 126. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. But what happens in the fall? The creeping thing that creeps on the earth, which is the lowest of those mentioned, the last mentioned, is that which takes dominion over the man. Subverting creation order, blaspheming Yahweh, spiking the ball. Uh, is Grace Church, I don't know where it is, it just says Grace Church. Is there a question? We're in Kingsburg, a little north of you, a few hours. Cool. Thanks, Dr. Strand. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you'd be willing to speak to Sam Albury's approach to this, mm. the homosexual issue. Uh, is that beneficial, or it seems there might be some pitfalls to some of the things he's doing? Um, would you be willing to talk on that? Yes, I, I know Sam and like Sam personally and a, appreciate him. And um, so some of the things that he has said publicly, uh, I, I affirm. But I, I can say that living out the organization that he has been affiliated with really has some troubling elements in it. And um, in general, the idea... I'm not recalling all the specific language in this conversation, so let me broaden it a little bit from Sam. But he he is in a, a group of evangelicals who do believe that there is some form of being gay that is a a part, an ongoing part of their identity. Um, Sam would not in any way affirm homosexual behavior, and I don't think he would affirm same-sex attraction as neutral, certainly not positive. But I don't recall all his statements right now and his precise position in the gay Christian world or, or, or in that conversation. But I will just say this. Uh, we need to recognize that same-sex attraction is an ungodly desire. James 1, 13 to 15 indicates that our desires are sinful. Our desires are not neutral. Yes, they give birth to sinful actions, as in James 1, 13 to 15, but even, even the desire to sin is itself sin. So this is where I'm not certain that Sam has it as tight as it could be. The matter of whether same-sex attraction itself at the impulse level is sinful. 
I believe that we need to preach and teach and proclaim that any instance of homosexual desire, same-sex attraction, is sinful. Just like any instance of heterosexual lust for someone not our wife is sinful. That's true whether it's a second long or whether it's 10 seconds long. That's true whether it's premeditated or whether it's, it comes from nowhere, seemingly. So there's more to say on that issue, but that's one of the major things we have to sort out in that conversation. And there are a good number today, sadly, of evangelicals who do not believe that the experience of same-sex attraction demands repentance, and that is my position, biblically. The experience of any ungodly desire, a flash of anger, not just premeditated anger, not just a long, simmering experience of anger, a flash of unrighteous hatred is sin. Matthew 5, 21 to 30. A flash of ungodly lust, being, a, being sexually attracted to a woman who is not my wife, merits repentance and confession. So the stakes are high here. When you study these issues on same-sex attraction, interestingly, it actually causes you to see that not only do we sin in that area at the level of desire, but in all sorts of areas. And so we're not laying a burden upon people who experience unwanted same-sex attraction in calling them to repentance. We're calling them to the way of the cross. And we're calling them to victory. The way out of your enslavement to temptation patterns is not to say, well, that wasn't a really long exercise of lust of whatever kind. I didn't feel jealousy of my classmate for a long period, so it's okay. I, oh, she's, she's hot and I desire her, but I'll bounce my eyes. I'll think about something different. No, the way for you and me to have victory over ungodly desire, which we all have in different forms, is to kill it. And you kill it by repenting of it, confessing it to God, and then asking God for power to turn from it. There is too much management of desire today and not nearly enough mortification of desire. That's what Paul says in Colossians 3. Mortify your sins. Kill them. That's when we will really make gains in godliness. When we experience ungodly desire and we don't just stop it or we don't just think about something else, that's not enough biblically. We should confess it and repent of it and ask God for power over it. And then one more step. We should then figure out in our life if there are any triggers of this behavior, and we should try to not do those patterns, <laughs> not go in those directions, rewire our, our thinking, our habits, so those are some initial thoughts. Uh, Jared, did you have? Are, do you have another um, question? Is your hand up? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if side B, the gay Christian side, makes this argument, but attraction and desire. Maybe they put forth. Well, attraction is different than desire in the way that recognizes that a woman is beautiful that's different than a, a lust for that woman and so maybe it's okay for me to recognize so with that I guess they're kind of making a, a distinction how would we respond and saying no it is okay for a man to just recognize naturally oh that woman is beautiful but reject lust but at the same time if you recognize a man as you know whatever that that's wrong how do we explain that it's a good question I think it's terminological so the way you're going to help people sort this out um, is to untangle the mess, the very serious mess that is currently playing out, sadly, in gay Christian circles over these issues. And so what we need to make clear is that it is entirely appropriate, 
as the Bible does, to recognize that different people are attractive. I mean, there are numerous individuals, David, Esther, others that we could name who are identified in some form as beautiful or handsome. That's not wrong. That's not wrong at all. Now, you, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but, but that's not wrong, objectively. Anytime, though, there is... That's not desire, though. That's not attraction. We're, we're, I'm not saying attraction. Other people may. I'm not. Because <laughs> I'm trying to guard holiness here and say, when my heart is pulled to that in a lustful way, we are not in the category of objective recognition of beauty. We are in the category, very widely populated biblical category, of lust, desire, passion. There, there's different terms, different words used, but we're in, we're in the same category. And when I am lusting after someone who is not my spouse, I am sinning. Now, someone may push further and say, okay, but how do I know where all the lines are? Because um, it's, you know, that sounds well and good in a theolo theological classroom, but when I'm out in the world, when am I objectively recognizing and when am I inherently lusting? Here again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just send this up. We're going to have to sort that out with the Holy Spirit. We are going to see attractive people. Seeing an attractive person is not sinning, necessarily. But we're also recognizing the natural pull of our heart, even as Christians, to desire those who are not our spouse. So that's how I would want to begin framing it. That is going to feel really simplistic to some folks in the gay Christian discussion on the, in, the, in the side B community. But I think, that's, I think we actually need that simplicity and that clarity. And we work from the clear to the less clear. Well, you're, you're later in the day, you're like, well, was I lusting after her? Was I not? Well, you know what? I, we may not be entirely certain. Uh, in general, let's, let's, uh, let's be quick to repent. And sadly, what has taken place in the gay Christian community is I think, oof, a very dangerous connection of repentance, regular repentance, to defeatism and discouragement. When you think of Luther, uh, Thesis 1 of the 95 Theses, the whole of the Christian life is a life of repentance. Now, it may well be the case, Jared, that so-called straight Christians haven't done enough repenting. Okay, I'm going to grant you that <laughs> in general terms. That's probably true for a lot of people. But that doesn't mean that repenting on a regular basis is defeatist or discouraging. It means you and I got to take up our cross and follow Christ. And that's hard. There's nothing about this that, that is supposed to be easy. There's nothing about this that, that is supposed to encourage the natural man. The natural man is our enemy. We're, uh, we're opposing him. We're attacking him. We're mortifying the flesh. So I, I fear that some of this is people who either are not converted or are converted but are not sufficiently seizing on the resources of divine grace in their life. 